gives me great pleasure to introduce to you this publication, The Gendered Contagion, Perspectives on Domestic Violence During COVID-19. This is a collaboration between the Center for Women in the Law and the Law and Society Committee, both at the National Law School and the Leaflet. It begins with a short foreword by Justice Prabhash Devan, where she turns the critical lens onto law and society and looks at the pandemic for what it is. Senior advocate Indra Jay Singh and fellow editor has written a very important piece reminding us of the trajectory of the law. She goes back to the basics to the time before a domestic violence law talks about the importance of a domestic violence law, points out the gaps during the pandemic where it has failed, and takes us on towards a future trajectory where um, you know, the law should go to deal with both the pandemic as well as the future. The publication itself is divided into four parts. The first part deals with how different groups have experienced the shadow pandemic, taking us through various viewpoints and discussing vulnerabilities of groups like minorities, children, disabled women, and Muslim women. The second part talks about dysfunctional state protection. Stay home, stay safe is a common greeting during these times. However, this has been a lie for many women. This section exposes that lie and points out the many gaps to different systems and how we have failed to ensure the protection of rights of women, children and other groups. The third section deals with queer vulnerabilities, a group that has not received much attention during the time of the lockdown. It also points to the blind spot that we have in our laws and in the way we tackle violence, both domestic violence as well as community violence. The fourth part looks at our neighbors. We see that Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, the Maldives have all had similar experiences and this part notes from the neighborhood shows us how similar we are and that these struggles are common ones across the region. Let me now quickly introduce my fellow editors. It's been wonderful to work with Ms. Indra Jai Singh, senior advocate and human rights lawyer, founder of the Lawyers Collective and an inspiration to many of us working in similar areas today. I'm grateful for some of the alumni of the National Law School who joined us as editors. Akshat Agarwal, legal and policy researcher working with an independent think tank in New Delhi at the moment. Manisha Arya working as a judicial law clerk and researcher at the Supreme Court of India. Vani Sharma, a lawyer practicing in Delhi and passionate about women's rights and family law. And Pranav Dhawan, a fourth year student here at the National Law School, joint convener of the Law and Society Committee here at the National Law School. And I'm the last editor. Uh, I'm Professor Sarasu Esther Thomas, working on areas of gender and human rights here at the National Law School. Let me finally invite you to this publication and I hope that it will be useful to you and in your work. Wishing you all the very best. The COVID-19 pandemic compels us to take a look at the human rights issues from different points of view especially in the context of domestic abuse. On the 24th of March 2020, as we all know, the government of India declared a nationwide lockout for 21 days. 
This was done under the Disaster Management Act. It limited the movement of the entire population of the country as a preventive measure against the spread of COVID-19 in India. People took it as a short-term measure, but it proved to be really what you can call a long-term measure. There were lots of positive messages at that time, including, for example, spend time with your family, stay home, stay safe. No one imagined in their wildest dreams that this message for some women could mean something that was far from being safe. A home sweet home for many women had no meaning because indeed intimate spaces have been known to be the site of violence and abuse between intimate partners well before the pandemic. Within a fortnight, there was a 100% increase in the number of domestic violence cases. This has been reported by the National Commission for Women. While this might sound like a daunting figure, the actual figures can be much higher because women don't report domestic abuse. Far less would they have the ability to report it during a lockdown. Well, it was the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act which was drafted and came into force in 2005, which offered at least a modicum of hope during this period. The Act itself defines violence to include emotional, sexual, psychological and physical violence. It had been functioning for over a period of 10 years before the pandemic broke. And so we had some experience of the functioning of this law. But indeed, none of us had any experience of how the law would function during a lockdown. One obvious implication of this was that access to justice was denied simply because free movement of people was denied. How did the law function in such a situation? What were the challenges? This volume documents and answers some of these questions. For me, it is the legal essays which stand out in this volume. Sangeeta Rege has documented how service providers were declared an essential service and therefore allowed free movement during the lockdown in order to be able to reach a victim of domestic violence when the victim herself could not reach the service provider or the court. Ujwala Kadrekar of the Lawyers Collective records how the multi-agency response put in place under the Act, but a response which lay dormant until the pandemic came into its own during the pandemic. NGOs, service providers suddenly realized that they had a role to play by reaching out to victims rather than waiting for victims to come to them. So in that sense, also, although the pandemic uh, was an acknowledged worldwide disaster, in some senses, it brought the dormant infrastructure of the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act to the surface and allowed service providers to play the role that they were meant to play under this act. Violence in the shared household was of course exaggerated during the pandemic. To me it seemed extremely ironic that one of the key features of this act, namely the right to reside in the shared household, became, in fact, the right to reside in a enclosed, near-prison-like situation. For even those who face intimate violence had the right to access justice, which they lost during the pandemic. And so perhaps it was necessary to reconceptualize the very right to reside in the shared household as a right to reside safely in the shared household. 
A deeper analysis would be required of this to come to any definite conclusions. For now, as the lockdowns have eased up, we hope that women in intimate situations are reaching out and realizing the potential of the act. Meanwhile, the Nirbhaya Fund, which was set up, was meant to bring into place one-stop crisis centers. My own contribution to this volume documents how the Nirbhaya Fund has not been spent and how it's necessary for us as activists to lobby for the proper utilization of funds which are dedicated to end violence against women. Although the system itself has functioned below optimum level, as almost all legal systems do, a step towards building infrastructures and networks by the state and supported by the state have been brought into place by the Domestic Violence Act 2006. While there have been setbacks, in general, it has been a success story. Few, few states have chosen to appoint a separate guard of protection officers. Others have given this job to existing bureaucracies. Courts have on occasion risen to this situation, but not always. Um, certain provisions of the law are underutilized, for example, the provision relating to compensation. And we lawyers need to work more on issues such as this. As someone who has been part of the journey, I have said very few people have the good fortune of seeing a law from the drafting board to its implementation. And I have had that opportunity with the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act. I take this opportunity to thank National Law School Bangalore and the leaflet, both of whom have collaborated to bring this valuable volume uh, and make it available to readers everywhere. It contributes to worldwide literature on the subject of domestic violence during the pandemic. I hope you will enjoy reading it as much as I did. Thank you.